On this channel over the years, we've done a whole lot of map drawing, cartographizing, not a word. But the act of drawing a map is only a very small part of the overall act of world building. Who lives there? What is their life like? What is their history? Who's in power? And on and on. In this video, I'll give you four questions to consider as you start the process of world building. Hi everybody, my name is Nate and you are watching WASD20, a channel about tabletop RPGs and fantasy maps. Today I'll be asking you four questions to launch you into world building, or help you out if you've already started. First, what is your purpose in world building? Second, should you build inside out or outside in? Third, how derivative, in other words, how similar will it be to existing worlds? And lastly, because it's WASD20, what about the map? First, what is your purpose? Figuring this out can help you determine your world building needs. There are many reasons people want to build a world, but for this video, we'll be focusing on three of them. World building for its own sake, world building for authors, and world building for game masters. There also might be some aspiring game designers, whether that's designing a new tabletop RPG or supplement, a board game, a video game. There's filmmakers, visual artists, and many others who might want to build a world, but we're just gonna focus on these three. First, world building for its own sake. There are people out there who just love the act of world building and simply creating is enough for them. Kingdoms, cities, mountain ranges, and more. They're free to delve deep into this region, that history, and just fly all over the world building out parts and pieces as their heart desires without any constraint. It is, however, hard to put the brakes on actual stories coming out of this world building as well at some point. So that world building actually does step into the realm of storytelling at times, even in its pure form. Still, our other purposes for world building have story at their very core. And when stories show up, we are not simply creating places anymore, but rather a setting. This word setting implies a story. Setting design might even be a better word than world building for the way most of us operate. Authors and game masters especially. So let's talk about authors for a minute here. Obviously, a novel needs a setting, and in this case, the author can develop the setting exactly as much as they feel is necessary to tell the story. Some certainly favor more setting information than others, and that's a matter of artistic taste. Tolkien, for example, included more world information in Lord of the Rings than most authors do. Some really like this, and some actually find it hard to read. But the point is that the author can write the story and develop just enough of the setting to serve the purpose of the story in their mind. Determining how much world information serves the story and when it becomes an indulgent deviation is one of the many great challenges for writers. Now, because I personally am a game master, not an author, I'll probably lean a bit more toward world building from the RPG game master's perspective throughout the rest of this video. That's the lens through which I see world building. So let's head there next. But first, I wanna thank my sponsor for this video, Dungeon Fog, who just launched a Kickstarter for their new expansion, Project Deus. Guys, I am so excited about this product. Project Deus aims to take Dungeon Fog's top-notch encounter map creator even further by adding tools for creating your very own custom maps for towns and cities, detailed region maps, and maps for entire worlds. These maps can all integrate well with each other and everything they've shown so far looks slick and intuitive. I'll put a link to their Kickstarter down in the video description, so definitely go check it out so you can stay in the loop with the development of this amazing tool. And you can even get hands-on access to alpha and beta versions when they're ready. I think you'll be really impressed by what you see over there, so go back it. And thanks Dungeon Fog for helping make these videos possible. Back to our purposes for world building, world building for game masters. A new wrinkle here is that GMs often have to anticipate player action or during a game session even be comfortable improvising a bit of setting information on the spot. This world building can be a little bit more freeform, collaborative, and personally I really like to leave enough breathing space in my world for players to actually join me in the world building. If you come to the table with a world that is set in stone, I think you'll be missing out on some great collaborative storytelling opportunities. Sometimes players will improvise something cool on the spot that adds something to the world, 
and sometimes their backstories give me ideas and we can hash out some new culture or secret order or something. You'll probably want to have enough basic world information in mind in order to guide this process, and that way when you improvise you can do so in a way that's consistent enough for players to suspend their disbelief. You want them to stay immersed in the world you're creating. So, world building for the sake of it, writing a book, running a game, or one of the many other reasons people do it, consider your purpose when starting to build your world so you can determine your world building needs. The second question, should I start outside in or inside out in my world building? Outside in refers to world building in broad strokes, starting with the big picture of a region or an entire world. Maybe you have a basic premise, an elevator pitch, like this. The rocky and dry world of Orith has been left ravaged by a demonic plague, and survivors cling to settlements near what little water remains. Or maybe you just need a quick catchphrase like, it's Mesoamerica with magically floating cities that war with one another. Inside Out, on the other hand, refers to starting small and letting it grow organically from an individual town or city. And that's the way I generally do it, but one of the advantages of Outside In building is that there's a sense of order when you start with the big picture. Your world has the basic premise and perhaps some kind of pillars, and one can more consistently apply that big picture vision to each of the individual locations of the world. Burying those locations, sure, but making them fit the whole. Especially if you're doing something very different from Earth, as many science fiction worlds do, starting to mess with the laws of physics and all that, starting with the big picture and then zooming in to see how that would affect life on a smaller scale seems to me like a much more orderly approach. For game masters and tabletop RPGs, especially folks newer to world building, I happen to think inside out world building is a great way to start. Many game masters recommend starting with one town and maybe a few adventuring locations in the area. And I agree, this is a great way to go. This is all you really need for several sessions of gameplay, and it relieves some pressure on the GM. I've heard some newcomers saying, I can't run a game yet, I'm not done with my world, I still need to finish my map, things like that. If that's your preference, that's fine, but don't ever think that you need that. Just spend a few minutes thinking of a town, an inn or a tavern, a few NPCs, maybe some possible quests, and, and jump in! This is how I started and it's gone pretty well. The only problem I've experienced using the inside out world building is that after creating one town that was a pretty typical fantasy Dungeons and Dragons town with a mayor, a tavern, a small temple, a general store, I found I had sort of painted myself into a corner in that now my world was destined to feel like a fairly typical fantasy setting. That's nonsense of course, feel free to change things as you go. As long as you aren't right in the middle of a long-running campaign, there's nothing wrong with hitting the reset button on your world and kind of tweaking things over the years. It's been a personal struggle I've had with Inside Out world building, but for newer game masters, it's still a method I usually recommend. And for that matter, you can do a combination of these. You can start with that basic premise, that kind of elevator pitch, and then go ahead and start building your individual town and build out from there over time. The third question, how derivative should you be? Now, the word derivative comes across as negative in most cases, but I don't necessarily mean it that way. Nearly all worlds derive their inspiration from something. Does your world have any two-legged creatures with arms hanging at their sides? Does it have any mountains or trees that are roughly like those of Earth? It's possible to get away from all this, and some great settings do. But it's rare, it's hard to pull off, and most people don't want to spend all their time in games or novels set in worlds that feel wholly different from Earth. How fantastical and far-fetched you go is a matter of taste, but the reality is people do tend to like the familiar. They like worlds they can understand. By all means, be true to your artistic vision of space mongols with six arms and purple skin, or a lush planet full of sentient ferns. But understand you might have a harder time finding an audience for your novel or gamers for your table the more gonzo it is. We'll get into a counter argument about that in a minute, but bear with me. When the trappings of your world feel familiar in some ways, it's easier for your players to lose themselves in a story. Less setup and exposition is necessary. So if you're playing a fantasy RPG like D&D, first off there is absolutely nothing wrong with just playing in one of the published settings. But we are talking about world building here, 
So if you are building your own world, there's nothing wrong with it being very similar to Forgotten Realms or Pathfinder's Galarian. You'll have an easier time with using the stock rules and character options and such when you're playing pretty close to home for your game system of choice, and you may have an easier time finding players for your table. Another method of making a setting accessible is by using real-world history as a starting place. One method is to think of a historical setting you enjoy and know about or want to learn more about, then you add magic, and then you make aspects of that culture's mythology real in your new setting. In this case, the more familiar the history, the easier time you're going to have getting players into the world and story. But that doesn't mean that ancient Greece or World War II Europe are better settings than a less known historical setting. Just be aware of the challenges you'll face making this world accessible. Most players don't want a 20 minute history lesson before playing an RPG. Now in terms of some terminology, we often refer to these fairly accessible settings as more grounded or more on the low fantasy side. But know that there are some amazing and very successful worlds that are very fantastical, high fantasy or gonzo. So let's get to that counter argument I mentioned. We can certainly argue that a lot of us love fantasy and sci-fi in the first place because the worlds are so different from our own. We pick up dice and tell stories to get away from the doldrums of our 9 to 5 job or whatever. Playing a game that puts me in the shoes of a purple skinned space mongol sounds a whole lot more attractive than one where I play a suburban father and husband trying to make it on YouTube. So, gonzo or grounded, the good news is you are not limited to creating only one world. Go nuts, have fun, and create all kinds of settings. Definitely consider drawing inspiration from existing settings or the real world, but if you stick pretty close to them, try to find ways to flex your creative muscle to make your world unique and awe-inspiring. A place where amazing stories can be told and people want to spend time. All right, the fourth question, what about the map? Should you start world building with a map? And as with all of the questions in this video, I will not be giving you any definite answers either way. I do think drawing a map can be a fine way to start building a world. Put your pencil to paper and see what happens. From your lines, natural borders may spring up, cities, cultures, ways of life. A map can inspire a world and stories. Many aspects of my world came to life as I was drawing the map, and I love that there are still areas on my map I only have vague ideas about. I still haven't fully explored them in my mind, and I just have some ideas and scribbles in my notes. But a map is just one of many things that can inspire world building, and I recommend you go for whatever inspires you. For a lot of people, however, a map is not a natural starting place. A lot of people have done a fair amount of thinking and writing about a world or region before they ever start a map. Whenever you do start drawing a map, however, I think you'll find it probably inspires new ideas. And whereas you might think that mapping it out is only for when you have things fairly solidified, I recommend drawing maps throughout the process of world building. You don't have to spend a lot of time on them, but make several drafts throughout the years and keep on tweaking things. To use an old cliche, I guess you could say world building is about the journey, not the destination. And hey, if you want some books to help you on the journey, I'll put some links below to some of my favorite books for world building, some of which I even used for this video. Also, I want to do more world building videos in the future. Towns, cities, pantheons, factions, governments in power, conflicts, all of that stuff. Coming soon, I hope. Before we go, I want to give a huge thank you to the WASD20 patrons. These people are amazing. Thank you, patrons. These people support WASD20 on a monthly basis. They also get some pretty cool rewards. And if you like my content and you want to help support my work here, you can go check it out at patreon.com slash WASD20. I want to thank Dungeon Fog once again for sponsoring this video. Go check out that Project Deus Kickstarter, link down below. And of course, if you have any comments or questions, please put them down below. I always love to hear from you. All right, that's all for this one, everybody. I'll be headed to Gen Con next week. Hope to see many of you there. If you see me, say hello. All right, take care, everybody. You'll see me again very soon.